Welcome, everyone. We're going to get going very quickly here. First, I would like to invite our candidates onto the stage in this order of their podium appearance. Jennifer Williamson. Jamie McLeod Skinner. Ryan Ruck. And Mark Hass. And with that, I'd like to introduce you to the vice chair of the Idaho Democratic Party. And yes, he has been here all weekend. He's going to be our timekeeper, and he will lead us on the Pledge of Allegiance. Jesse Malinato. I pledge allegiance. All righty, thank you. We're going to go through a, a few ground rule, rules and just get right to it. But how are you doing? All right, okay. You had a good weekend, I hope. And so welcome to the closing event, the Secretary of State's debate. Uh, so I hope you're feeling inspired, ready to work, and ready to hear from these great candidates. First, audience ground rules. If you have signs, that fi that's fine. Just make sure they don't block anybody's uh, vision to the stage. Uh, remember... Applause is fine, but it does cut into the deba debate time. We want to hear as much as we can from the candidates. And finally, just double check and make your sure your cell phones are on silent. Uh, ground rules for the candidates. We will start with two minutes op opening in the order that you've seen. And the order, will, the order was drawn ran randomly prior to the debate. And this order will continue throughout the, the debate, questions, and their closing comments. We have a series of questions, and candidates will have 90 seconds to respond. Then candidates will have three minutes to close. I am being assisted today, like I said, of our special guest, Vice Chair of the Idaho Democratic Party, Jesse Malinato. Let's give him a hand. He is our timer, and he has these magical signs, which he will wave, and which you will be able to see since they, so, they are so large. So, um, I can be kind of fierce on timing. We don't have Academy Awards music, but I will be urging you to keep to timing. Um, and then we will, I think we're ready to go. You ready to go? Yeah. All right, let's get this show started. Okay, let's begin with our opening statements. And as I said, through the random order of drawing, Jennifer Williamson, please lead us up. Thank you, thank you, Casey, and thank you all for being here this morning. I'm a fourth generation Oregonian. I was born and raised on a farm out in Washington County, and my great-great-grandfather was the oldest person to sign the Oregon Constitution. So to say that voting is a rite of passage in my family would be an understatement. In fact, I remember the first time I went to the little uh, country school where my dad would go to vote, and I remember the, the time I turned 18 and I got to go vote with him. And that was the same year I went off to the University of Oregon, and um, that was the year that Measure 9 was on the ballot. And for those of you who remember, that was the ballot measure that would strip uh, civil rights, core civil rights for many Oregonians, and it really sought to continue to marginalize the LB LGBTQIA community into the shadows. And I joined the fight against that ballot measure and registered students to vote. The, the folks that, that were were uh, in that fight, were counting on people like me, young people like me, not to stand up and be counted and to vote. But you know what, we won because we did stand up and we did vote and we were counted. But we're now in a fight not just for our civil rights, but for our very democracy. Our very democracy is on the line. And we're the only ones that can save it. And that's why I'm running for Secretary of State. In the legislature, we needed to stand up and lead the way because Oregon is a, a progressive beacon and our country is moving to the right. I was honored to be elected majority leader to lead the fight to continue to keep Oregon that progressive beacon. We led the fight to guarantee access to abortion and to birth control to pass the, the most expansive paid family medical leave law in the country. I stood up and we fought the NRA and we won. I ran on these things, I fought for these things and we won. Thank you, Jennifer. Jamie. 
Hi, my name is Jamie McLeod Skinner. I want to welcome those of you who have traveled to Central Oregon. I thank our organizers, the hotel workers, uh, my family, kids, and wife uh, who are supporting me, um, the, and those who stay true to our values. Also want to remember Atwe Elijah Cummings. Uh, I'm running for Secretary of State to protect our democracy, to build stronger communities, and to safeguard our environment. If Democrats are to win, we need to em embrace values-driven leadership, be better stewards, and show we can work together to serve all Oregonians. When I was eight years old, my mom told me to always leave a place better than I found it. She role modeled hard work. As a single mom with two kids, she uh, drove, got up early to drive a school bus, taught all day, and drove a school bus home. In the summer, she helped put food on our table by picking fruit with migrant workers. She also role modeled being bold. She took a teaching job in Tanzania when I was a kid where she met the man who had become my dad. When I graduated from Ashland High School, I was grappling with that fear of coming out. And at that time, it didn't seem possible that someday I would be standing here and asking my fellow Oregonians for the honor of serving as your Secretary of State to ensure that we choose our government and our government serves us. I took my mom's advice and worked to make the world a better place as a civil engineer, as an environmental planner, as a natural resource attorney, and an elected official. I used my education, experience, and influence to protect vulnerable communities. When my community is in need, I listen and take action from government oversight to co-founding partnerships to combat uh, climate change to naturalization, voter registration, self-sufficiency services for refugees and immigrants, even forcing an absentee congressman to play defense while the House flipped. Prior to last year, the last two times a Democratic congressional uh, candidate won this district was in 1974 and 1929. I'm proud of my reputation as being fair, inclusive, and a bridge builder, and I'd welcome your support. Thank you. Ryan. Ryan, go ahead, please. Hi there. My name is Ryan Ruck. I'm running for Secretary of State because I want to promote civic engagement, audit public accounts, and protect public records. I have a reputation as an office manager and a human resource manager as well. I'm a data analyzer and I, uh, I frequently have taken looks at what, what opportunities are available to serve the public and uh, I'm thrilled to have this opportunity. As many of you can tell, I'm 28 years old, <laughs> so I'm very young uh, and, I'm, and um, promoting civic engagement is what I would really want to uh, be a part of my, my platform. Um, election security is uh, also a very important aspect as well. I know we'll get into that a little later, but um, seeing the voter suppression efforts from the other side um, has made it become clear that we absolutely need to focus on that aspect. And uh, that is one of the main duties of the Secretary of State. And. Uh, I uh, have family who lives all over the world, um, and uh, they have personally um, been affected by some of these um, federal policies in place. And uh, <clears throat> I, I'm really hoping that I can do whatever I can to be to do my part in in my civic engagement um, uh, to promote um, that type of unity that we need as a as a, both as a democratic party and as a state, and as a country. Thank you, Ryan. Mark. Thank you. My name is Mark Hass, and I'd like to use up some of my time to acknowledge two women here today. One of them is someone who works with special needs children, children who have disabilities, children who have autism. And through her, I've learned that these children need to be included, not excluded. They need to be supported and they need to be loved, and her name is Tamara Haas, and I'm She's fortunate right to have her in my life, so thank you. <laughs> I would also like to acknowledge uh, Jamie McLeod Skinner. I don't know if Democrats have come together and said thank you for running in a very hard <laughs> district race last year. She did that, and uh, as an Oregonian and as a Democrat, I just applaud that, and I thank you. Um, Oregonians deserve a strong and experienced Secretary of State, capable of delivering what they value, fairness, protecting democracy, and always telling the truth. 
Of all the state offices in Oregon, this is the one where trust and integrity are so important. There are a lot of reasons I'm running for Secretary of State. I want this to be a policy-driven campaign, not one that's based on who raises the most money or who's the cutest, in which case I would come in dead last. <laughs> <laughs> so um, let's get right to it. Let's get to those policies, beginning with redistricting. Uh, very important to me. Redistricting is very obscure, but it's very important, especially to Democrats. And this is imprinted on my mind because my very first session, um, a band of feisty House Democrats had to prevent a Republican gerrymandering scheme, and I was part of that crowd along with Jeff Merkley and Deborah Kafori, who was helping me on my campaign. And if we hadn't prevented that, Oregon would be like Wisconsin, North Carolina, and Texas. And we won that battle. I've been through two of these. I'm the only one up here who's been through one, let alone two. And this is top of my priority list. And I look forward to talking about these policies with you in a policy-driven campaign. All right, thank you, Mark. All righty, that closes our opening statement, so we'll go right to the first question. Candidates, and this can the order for answering will be, Jamie, you'll answer this first, sure. then Ryan, then Mark, then Jennifer. You will see the pattern. <laughs> so, Oregon has led the way in ballot access with reforms like online registration, vote by mail, and most recently, automatic voter registration. Do you see additional ways we can implement our party's values by expanding access to the ballot and making voting easier? Jamie. Absolutely. First of all, voting should be secure and accessible to all. And want to uh, thank our county clerks for their work to do that every day. Um, so things we can do now are making sure information is accessible, providing uh, ac ballot ac um, information in multiple languages, providing better online access. Um, reinstating the voter education staff, and they need to be bilingual to make sure people understand closed primaries and that houseless people can designate a location to receive their ballot. We need to uh, protect the advances we've made, and I applaud all those who've worked on those in the past. Um, we need to uh, uh, review our auto registration process because I've heard from a rural county clerk that if the DMV makes a mistake, someone can be inadvertently taken off our voter rolls. And we need to support the innovations going on in our counties, from Jackson U. Matilla, the online uh, um, ballot um, voting for overseas service members, and Benton County looking at star voting. But there's also future opportunities. Um, expanding voting to 17-year-olds for school board races and starting that process to look at getting younger people engaged. Same day or closer registration. Making postmarks count. I think it's important to make sure all ballots count. And using state agency da data, all state agencies, because not everyone re-registers in the DMV when they move, so that we can register new voters. And removing the 21-day period after registration. Some of those things need to go through the legislature, and we need that leadership in the legislature to do that. But I think those are all good starting points to make sure we have more Oregonians having access to the ballot. Thank you. Ryan. Website updates are essential. Uh, the easiest registration experience results from a streamlined process. Uh, design on a website can make the difference between voters and non-voters. I would advocate for the communication channels to be modernized for a simplified experience. Uh, we, we aren't using a multi-language pointer page uh, <clears throat> in the registration process. In, uh, and in our diverse state, that should change. Um, so when we are out of date with the uh, modern communication methods, uh, it makes the public sector appear to be falling behind to uh, the, the private sector, which isn't good. Um, <clears throat> it's important to join the times and, and uh, make updates, um, and update to methods that make sense for all Oregonians and are inclusive of our diverse communities. Thank you. Mark. Well, I have long advocated uh, that Oregon needs same-day registration. It's the biggest, most glaring void we have in voter access. Um, it has to go to the Constitution. It has to change the Constitution, so it has to go to voters. And they will have the final say. Currently, 21 days uh, to register, and you can't vote if, you're, if you don't make that, that window, and it's, it's just too long. Um, the argument against it has always been this would be a, a burden on counties. And but 17 states now have this, and I've talked to some of those states about this, and they say, well, with good planning, it's not a burden, and if the state helps, it's not. So this will be one of my highest priorities, to get same-day registration uh, referred to voters. One of my top priorities as Secretary of State is having Oregon have the highest voter turnout there is. 
Number two, this will give a stronger voice to voters, and that's getting the big money out of campaigns. Next November, and I hope you'll all vote for this, we will have a chance to change our Constitution to allow us to limit campaign contributions. The measure that's on the ballot was one that I was the chief sponsor of in the legislature this year, and that's the first step to setting reasonable limits to these campaigns. No more billionaires donating millions of dollars to Newt Bueller. How about that for a concept? Thank you, Mark. Jennifer. Automatic voter registration has made a huge difference, but there's so much more we can be doing, as you've heard. As Secretary of State, I believe we need a democracy agenda that would increase access to voting so that everyone can participate. Um, first, democracy in preferred languages. Language shouldn't be a barrier. We should expand automatic voter registration to other state and county um, agencies. We need, as you've heard, same-day voter registration, postmark deadlines because rural vo voices need to be heard. This is done in Washington. It is not hard to do. Um, Oregonians need to be able to track their val ballots, not in just some counties, but in all counties. We need to take information out into communities like they do in Colorado and we're testing in Multnomah County. Um, there's there, like, there's so much to be done, and we've, we've heard it today, but I think the most important thing is engaging with and listening to communities of color, rural communities, and advocates for people with disabilities about what it will take to engage voters and get to that deeper access. Um, it's much like the abortion conversation we've been having in Oregon. Not having restrictions doesn't mean you have access. So we need to have that same conversation around voting. What are the barriers that exist, and how do we address them? Thank you, Jennifer. <laughs> Moving on to our second question, and the second question will be answered first by Ryan. In addition to elections, the audits, the audits function of the Secretary of State's office has become increasingly high profile. Who should decide which audits to pursue? The legislature, the Secretary of State, the State Audit Director, or do you have an alternative proposal? Ryan, go ahead. Um, although I have audited experience, um, I feel that, it, uh, and I feel confident in my ability to conduct audits, it takes a team effort to make sure that audits are conducted uh, fairly and, and correctly. <clears throat> I, um, if I come across line items that, uh, um, don't make sense or, or aren't immediately clear, uh, I hold off on that line item until, uh, until I can get clarification. And in that respect, it's good to have a uh, collaborative effort to help in that regard. Uh, on the other hand, too many cooks in the kitchen spoil the soup. <laughs> By that, I mean a variation of opinions and methods can make it more difficult to complete audits. So I propose that audits uh, be conducted by the departments closest to the expenditures so no premature judgment uh, causes uh, inaccurate outcomes. Uh, then, <coughs> then upon an, an initial completion of the audits, uh, the, the audit should be reviewed by the Secretary of State uh, Department for, to ensure accuracy and accountability. Uh, that form of balance will encourage proper spending habits as well. Thank you. Mark? Well, I think the Constitution answers this question. Article <laughs> 6, Section 2 says, the Secretary of State elected by the people shall be the decision maker on public audits. So I'll have the final say on all audits. There is an advisory role for the legislature to play, which of course, as a legislator, I would honor. Um, and it's very important to me. This speaks to my background. The audits division is the largest division in the Secretary of State's office today. It has about 75 employees. And um, one of the first audits that I will make sure we can uh, conduct is on our Student Success Act, which was very important to me that just recently passed. It's taken me years to work on that. And we finally got it through. It's now state law. And I just want that thing to work the way everybody intended. I want us to all be on the same page. It's nothing punitive, but I want to make sure that money gets into classrooms for teachers to use so we can reduce class sizes, so we can lengthen school years and make sure it works. And so um, I'm hoping that will be audit number one on my watch. And second, when we do an audit, it's very imp important to me that the auditors have complete independence to conduct these audits no matter where they go. 
And a person whom I have a lot of respect for who did that was Kate Brown. For better or worse, whatever they would have, she would, she, as Secretary of State, would not interfere in those audits. And that's important to me. It goes back to trust and integrity. Thank you. Jennifer. Well, as you heard, the um, audit should be led by someone who's directly accountable to the voters, and the Constitution speaks to that. But I think as Oregonians, we deserve a progressive leader who will put our values into action and that we can count on to use this really powerful audit function uh, in the Secretary of State's audit office to identify which barriers our systems are causing for people who are left out of our democracy and out of our society and out of our economy. Um, I'll lead the audits division with an eye towards our progressive values and with an eye towards equity in everything that happens in the Secretary of State's office. Of course, absolutely, we will hold state agencies accountable for how they spend our taxpayer dollars, but I also think that we need to audit to Oregon values. And I think my work on justice reinvestment is a great example of this, where we made sure we were spending our tax dollars in a responsible way to get outcomes that we wanted for our communities. We incentivize better behaviors, telling counties, if you don't use prison beds, we will give you that money back for better outcomes in your communities to make your community safer for things like addiction treatment and, um, and services and programs that better served communities. As Secretary of State, I believe it would be my job to make our governments fully accountable for the people and use an equity approach for every audit and a community-based approach for auditing. Thank you. Jamie. Um, audits are the roadmap to ensuring better government and protecting our vulnerable communities. And that's everything from foster kids to seniors as well. It's also how we build public trust. Something very important about the audit process is understanding how local government works. It goes beyond just setting laws, but really understanding how the institution functions. And so that background experience is critically important to do this role well. The Secretary of State, as was mentioned, decides and should decide. Um, but with input from the public, and there's a hotline if you don't know about it, check it out. Um, also from the legislature and governors and state agencies from their internal audits to figure out how to best uh, target that. Then, of course, once that's determined, the state auditor, um, uh, audit director, will develop the plan and perform that, that task. The auditors performing that work need to be independent because that's part of the building public trust. Of course, it's with an equity lens. That's what we need to be thinking about in our Oregon Way 2.0. Um, the legislature makes laws and allocates money, and legal counsel can help clarify intent, but that's, that's their lane. Um, it's, it's important that we require our state agencies to also audit their private subcontractors because the conversation that uh, we had in 2016 about protecting foster kids, it was because that, that role was not being focused on and, and, and protections went overlooked. We need to make sure we're leveraging our resources, uh, Secretary of State, uh, State providing tools to um, regional, um, regional bodies as well to help leverage their resources and make sure our state and local agencies get some of that support. Thank you. Going on to question three. And our lead answer person for this will be Mark. Question three. Oregon is well known for pioneering direct democracy. Do you think ballot access for initiatives is too easy, too difficult, or just right? <laughs> <laughs> well, to be honest with you, uh, until recently I would have said just right. Uh, we cracked down on the rampant fraud that, uh, perpetrated by Bill Sizemore and his corporate backers, and we made it more difficult for big money to buy initiative measures. But two weeks ago, a recent decision by the Secretary of State to reject three environmental measures was nakedly partisan, and it caused me to reconsider this question. Those ballot measures were rejected without going through the standard process of the Attorney General, and there is so far no documented evidence or explanation as how they arrived at that uh, decision. So if I'm elected as Secretary of State, that will never happen, and I will fix it so that it can never happen again. The Secretary of State has to be above board when it comes to initiative campaigns. Integrity and trust are central to this job. Thank you. Jennifer. Let me start by saying I think the fundamental issue in this campaign is protecting our democracy, and it's a central job of the Secretary of State to lift up the voice of every citizen, no matter what we look like, where we come from, what color we are, what language we speak, what religion we have or don't have, who we love. Every eligible citizen has the right to be heard and to have their voice counted. And that's how our democracy works. 
So I think our initiative system is something we should be very proud of because it celebrates every voter. And I strongly support it, but we also need to protect it. As Secretary of State, I would crack down on fraudulent and misleading petition tactics and ensure transparency behind uh, funding all ballot initiatives. And in, in instances, we already have these laws in place, but they need to actually be enforced. I also believe we need to go further in guaranteeing that Oregonians know how and who the bills are being paid by for political advertisements and materials that they're seeing, including in our initiative process. And we need to ensure the initiative process system doesn't get abused or manipulated or twisted by powerful, wealthy, elite, or dark money or big money corporations. Thank you. Jamie. Uh, 2020 is going to be all about protecting and securing our democracy. And um, our ability to participate in it is very important. Uh, the process needs to be clear, transparent, and impartial. And Mark was absolutely right when he called out the recent, the recent um, uh, violation of that, essentially, by our current uh, Secretary of State. Um, so the, I would agree the process is generally good, but we need better protections. Um, we need that impartial review process for ballot language. In that case, there was no uh, DOJ legal determination, and that was not going with the standard process. Another issue that has not been addressed that I think we should be thinking about is uh, the veracity of signature gathers, what they're saying to folks um, when they're collecting signatures. And um, my wife and I had this experience when we were in Medford, and the the signature gathering that went on to become Measure 105, Ballot Measure 105, there was inaccurate things being said. And we had a conversation, essentially an argument with a guy who was saying it and calling it out, and, and it resulted in a lot of people walking away and not signing. But that kind of, <laughs> that, it, it's, it's about all of us. And when it's not, we're not targeted, someone else is, and they've got our backs and we've got to have theirs as well. So that's, that's who we are as Democrats. Um, but we need to be looking at that process and make sure that, that we can engage in the process and collect signatures as voters, but not have it be a paid for profit way to target our communities. Thank you, Ryan. Ballot access is on the border of being too easy. <clears throat> we need to make sure that access is granted in a way that does not invite hackers to the table. Ease of access is not the only element to focus on either. Although we do want easy access to the ballot, we also want to combat, combat voter su suppression by encouraging civic engagement. I took it upon myself to promote a message for unity uh, on an uh, ad in Spanish uh, on a Portland radio station. I didn't use a personal website because I viewed it as more important to register voters than to promote myself. That said, <coughs> there was a concern that registration access may be confusing to our diverse communities because there is not an easy link to registration in alternative languages. Although it is currently possible to access alternative languages, uh, if the process begins in one language, it becomes more difficult for diverse communities to access the information that they need. So in that respect, I see room for improvement in the registration system. Thank you. Our fourth question, our, uh, Jennifer, you'll be the first to answer. The fourth question involves the Secretary of State's office itself. The office uh, has four public face facing divisions, elections, audits, corporation, and archives. But operations include all of the attended financial, personal, personnel, and other support services that come with a running a large state agency. So while it's not, so not only is the Secretary of State a public officer, but uh, the Secretary has significant management responsibility. What background and or other experience would you bring to this agency management role? Sorry, Casey, I was looking for, what it's was the, no okay, it's number two. I was like, wait, what? Um, <laughs> hold on, oh, there it is, okay, I thank you. I just was like, that was in my discard pile, <laughs> thank you. Um, so, as I've said, I am a proven progressive leader and I believe that leadership is all about values. I've had the honor of being a public servant in a leadership role at Portland State University at the Department of Education and in the Oregon Legislature as Oregon House Majority Leader. At PSU, I was an Associate Vice President for Public Affairs and I led the team that was the public face of Portland State University. At the Department of Education as a Public Affairs Officer, I led the team that interacted with the public, with legislators and lawmakers and the media to help improve education for our kids. And as House Majority Leader, 
I had the privilege to lead the team that won the historic supermajority of 38 members, the most diverse caucus that Oregon has ever seen. And we created history as a team. In 2017, when I was the majority leader, we passed the Reproductive Health Equity Act, the most expansive act covering abortion and reproductive health care in the United States. We also passed pay equity. It was an amazing session. But then we went on to this last session, which was more historic. We passed an enormous historic K-12 investment, the nation's strongest and most inclusive paid family medical leave act. Our team was willing to take on the climate crisis and pass it. We're ready to do it again in February. And I've demonstrated my ability to lead diverse teams across all of these experiences. And as your Secretary of State, you can count on me to lead a diverse team that looks like Oregon. Thank you. Jamie. This job is about understanding how government actually functions, not just how laws are made, how to manage teams and budgets, how to provide uh, culturally appropriate services to diverse populations. I have 12 years of experience in government staff and management, a senior planner and management analyst and, analyst and union member for the second largest city in Silicon Valley, environmental planner and union member for a regional water agency, served two million customers, urban and rural, law clerk for the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, LUBA, the Klamath County Circuit Court, uh, city manager for Phoenix, Oregon, and nine years of government experience as an elected and appointed policymaker. A city councilor with uh, 120,000 population, um, a half a billion dollar budget, and almost a thousand employees. Um, a board member previously uh, serving on the audit, water and conservation, economic development, housing, public power, and ethics committees, among others. And currently is a board member of the Jefferson County ESD and the Oregon Watershed Enhancement Board. I'm a small business owner, a consultant, and natural resources attorney, and my nonprofit experience, including managing multi million projects in teams in the US and internationally, serving diverse and vulnerable communities. And the leadership training I have had includes the Harvard University Senior Executives in State and Local Government, the Markla Center for Applied Ethics in Public Policy and the Oxford Consortium for Human Rights. I think that background is critically important so that we are not just understanding how organizations work, that we're able to um, help them to work better, and we understand how to incorporate uh, diverse communities into leadership, into decision making. And my background, I think, makes that message. Thank you, Ryan. There are a couple elements to that question, so I'll break it down a little bit. Uh, <clears throat> I do have audit experience. Every fiscal quarter to half year, I conduct a uh, reconciliation for our company books. I examine expenditures to apply proper ca categorization. And if I see something questionable, I hold off on that line item until I get uh, clarification. Um, one year, uh, the company that I worked for was on the receiving end of an employment audit, which we passed because of my meticulous documentation. I, I keep digital records of every expenditure and revenue for the company that I work for, and I would be happy to take that uh, with me to the public sector. Uh, for the past couple of years, I have had office management experience. Uh, th this uh, comes with the responsibilities of day-to-day -day operations and big picture items. Um, while managing pro projects and dispensing proper personnel and resources um, is important, um, I, I like to make sure that uh, projects are uh, completed timely and accurately. Uh, keeping, small business, uh, uh, keeping a small business ahead in the private sector is constantly requiring me to, to be creative to, to keep us afloat. <coughs> and uh, I've also been a human resources manager, an off, uh, a marketing strategist, and a communication spe specialist, and a data analyst. I get to wear a lot of hats because I'm not afraid to do the work. I see the need for transparent government with an open door policy. Thank you. <laughs> Mark. Thank you. This is really a question about financial management experience, and this really is what I've been doing in my private sector job for the last 13 years as an accounts manager, managing clients' money, managing client accounts, making sure uh, production schedules are met, that people are paid in the right time. We use um, project management software for this. As it keeps evolving, it seems like every time I would just figure out one version, we'd have to change to a new version. And uh, we had final financial tracking systems very similar to what state agencies uh, use today. So I'm confident that would be a smooth transition for me. Uh, but a more salient point about my experience with money and the economy has to do with the Student Success Act. We keep hearing about how rich our country is, how well Oregon is doing, but that 
that rings hollow to a lot of us, doesn't it? Because of the, the lower rungs of the socioeconomic ladder, there's a huge wealth gap in our state and we see it every day. So in the Student Success Act, which you've probably heard about all the benefits to education, and that's great, I was in charge of the tax part of that. And what we did was we tripled the tax on corporations and gave working people a modest reduction in the personal income tax. And that was very important to me. I was proud of that. Maybe we didn't eliminate the entire wage gap in Oregon, but we kicked a dent in it, and I was proud of that. Thank you. We're going to question five, and Jamie, you will lead off on this question. With clear evidence that foreign governments tampered with and spread misinformation about U.S. elections in 2016, what additional steps can we take to make our elections more secure? This is a critically important question. Uh, and building public trust requires that elections, we have security and uh, our elections are inclusive as well. Um, so I would appoint a, an election security officer, someone who would identify weaknesses, report results, who essentially would think like a hacker. Um, and uh, train, provide training on, on ways that we as voters can better uh, recognize some of the, the fake news dumping that's happening. It's interesting, you talk to younger folks, they're much more savvy about this than folks with gray hair, I'm just saying, um, I've had those conversations. Uh, we need to verify our tally machines that are counting our paper ballots because there have been irregularities in the, irregularities in the past in that, we need to, to stand on top of that. Um, we need to enhance security while um, uh, county clerks are connected to the internet net, while they're are tra are transferring that, that vote data. We need to um, secure remote ballot boxes with camera surveillance. Um, and the voter registration, um, uh, make sure that system's working, because again, as I mentioned before, I've heard um, the issue raised by a rural clerk who essentially said that, um, you know, sometimes, it's not always, but sometimes there's misinformation that comes from the DMV about someone who's moved out of the area, and if that happens, they take them off the rolls. Well, that, that can inadvertently happen. She says, our community is so small, our county is so small, we know the person, so we don't take them off, but that's happened before. We gotta essentially audit that system to make sure it's working as it's supposed to. And then also, um, you know, transparency, campaign finance reform, all these big things we talked about, they also help and are, are critical to that process as well. Thank you. Ryan. The registration process should employ a two-step verification system and stronger recapture technology. Additionally, voter suppression can be defended against by promoting civic engagement, as I've said previously. Uh, getting ordinary people to offer input on laws, run for office, vote, and uh, uh, update business registration will keep our, our, our system honest and authentic. An honest system starts with we the people. And we the people can prevent election insecurity simply by participating. It is the duty of the office to attempt to prevent attacks on the election system. By protecting the registration system with two-step verification by mail, and employing software security to prevent against bot attacks and other security threats, we enhance voter faith in the system. Additionally, I found Senator Wyden's calls uh, for voluntary uh, state cooperation with federal assistance to be a mutual benefit for the state and federal governments. Uh, that type of bond will create a more impenetrable uh, structure uh, resistant to hackers. Thank you. Mark. We need an overhaul in our election security, and I will make sure the elections division has the staff, the budget, and access to the newest and best technology to prevent an attack by foreign governments that we know will come. The 2014 hack of the Secretary of State's office shut down the campaign finance database. That was a wake-up call, and we should never be complacent like that again. Our vote-by-mail system protects us from voter fraud simply because it's on paper. You can't hack paper. I'm surprised that all 50 states don't have vote-by-mail. You tamper with one vote, yeah. But we have 2.7 million voters in our registered database, and that's where we are vulnerable. I've been talking to county clerks and technology firms, and this is where they see tomorrow's threat. We need to keep not just one step ahead, we need to keep 10 steps ahead, and I will make sure we have massive cybersecurity walls on our database. As for spreading misinformation, as a former journalist, it's a vexing and contemptible problem to me, but a reality we have to deal with. In recent years, the Secretary of State has had to quash rumors that votes are already being counted when they weren't, that vote 
vote by mail ballots, it's too late to send them in when that wasn't true. There are now actually security experts that work on this. I will have those experts, those officers in my office as well to look at this and to look at egregious violations of election law to make sure those laws are enforced because they're not yeah, being enforced now. That's a good point. Thank you. Jennifer. If there's clear evidence of tampering, we need to attack it head on. Look, the Trump administration we know they're not going to make it a priority, which means we have to make it a priority. They don't even seem to believe it's an issue. That means the work in the Secretary of State's office and in the county clerk's office is even more important. Oregon's on the front line. We're on the front line nationally for this work. We are protecting our democracy through our system. And I'll fight for every federal dollar that's available for cybersecurity to protect our election data, our records, our voter records, our registration system, and our process. We need those resources. And not only do we need the safest and most secure system possible, we need all Oregonians to believe it is the safest system possible. Because if they don't believe it, they don't trust it, they're not going to vote. And that's part of the issue. Trump and his actions have called into question our democratic system and our process, and he's abusing this power to scare people and keep them away from registering and keep them away from voting, and that's part of the problem. He's, the, the, he's turning people away from getting the very services they're entitled to that would then register them to vote. That's part of the problem. It's the job of the Secretary of State, in addition to securing our systems, but to stand up to this administration to make sure that these bullies are not keeping our voters away from the, from the ballot box and protecting our democracy so that our progressive values are insured. Thank you. Going to the next question, our ans first answer will come from Ryan, and appropriately, it's about <laughs> young folks in Oregon. <laughs> what would you say to a young person or an Oregonian not involved with the democratic process to encourage them to vote? Sure. You are the future. Uh, you can choose to participate and make changes that uh, you see fit, or you can sit on the sidelines and go with the flow. If you go with option B, which may sound easier, you forfeit your right to complain. Uh, if you want to make changes, you have to be a part of the solution. Not, <clears throat> not engaging in the democratic process will result in changes that affect you. It simply won't be the type of changes that you want. Uh, that's the duty of, of this uh, position. It, it's a seat for the people. And this position exists to evoke action from the people among other responsibilities, but that is the most important element. Thank you. Mark. What I do tell young people is the stories that happen almost every election. When I was a journalist some years ago, I covered a city council election that ended in a tie, an actual tie vote. And anybody that didn't vote in that election could have made the difference. They had to flip a coin to determine a winner. In fact, there is a guy here, a Councilor Morales. I don't know if he's here today. Um, but yes. All right. Talk to him about the importance of voting. He, he survived a recount. He didn't even know who won until after Thanksgiving, but he won by about 50 votes. And votes can't ask Kate Brown. She won her first election by seven votes. I had to give the same speech to my own daughter three years ago, who had kind of the same question, why does my vote matter? And I gave her these stories. And she ended up voting for the first time, voted for Hillary, and voted for her dad. <laughs> <laughs> So the only way to secure the future is to vote. Climate change is the best example. My son Sam is, uh, is only 12 and he's always asking me about climate change, when you guys are gonna work on that. I think we'd be much further down the road on climate change if more young people voted. Thank you, Jennifer. You know, encouraging young people anything, telling young people anything, you, anybody who has a teenager knows you can't tell young people anything. I mean, the bottom line is young Oregonians are taking to the streets, they're skipping school, they're marching, they are demanding that we take on real problems and protect them from gun violence, climate, uh, climate crisis. Um, and I think the real question is, what are we gonna do to amplify what they're saying to get their parents and their grandparents to vote for their future? Uh, the students who formed uh, Students Demand Action, they understand that lawmakers don't make their fears and their safety a priority. 
and that young people of color have been dealing with gun violence on a daily basis and adults are not taking it seriously. LGBTQIA young people know that their future is in the hands of this Supreme Court the students I march with in the climate strike, they know exactly what happened to the climate bill in the Oregon Senate this last session, and they know what's being threatened again in February. They know what's happening. So the real question is, how are we knocking down barriers so that those students who are marching in the street can march to the ballot box and vote for their future? And what are we doing to make sure that they can get their voices heard so that every voice is heard and every vote is counted? We cannot. We, we don't need to encourage them to do anything. We need to get out of the way. Thank you. Jamie. Well, I can tell you what I've done the last two years in traveling around two-thirds of our state when I was in forums and house parties and asked this exact question. I handed the microphone to a young person in the room and say, what do you think? Because I think we should not lecture but listen on this one. Um, Samantha Gladu has, I'm not quoting her because she had a fabulous thing to say. She says, rethink it. Say, young people vote because. And let's follow that because like we really do want them to vote. And it's not just young people, it's people of color, it's vulnerable communities, it's, it's folks th uh, throughout our state who are not feeling heard. So give folks a microphone, learn the perspective and their experience, and then respond like we want them or us to vote. Um, we need to look beyond the inside game and develop the, uh, the potential of those not reflected in leadership. Equity is critical because people show up when they see themselves reflected in elections and issues. And um, voter registration. So we have, to, we have to listen. We have to understand how we do this work, how we're responsive on these critical issues. And then we need to make sure we are helping in part of the process. Part of the problem on this, and I, as, as, a, as a mom, as a stepmom, I, is my thinking really evolved? Because I used to think it was about what do I tell my kids? And then I learned, I've got a, their experience is very different than mine. And I had to learn that and understand that before I could help be effective. I think that's what we need to be doing in government in general. We need to be doing a lot more listening rather than lecturing on this one. And uh, voter registration, um, address issues that, that folks care about, they've been mentioned. That's, that's how we do this. Thank you. <laughs> Going to our seventh and final question. The debate about open records has only gotten more complicated and challenging for elected officials as digital records replace paper records as a primary source of information for the public. How will you approach the leading role that the archives division plays in assuring that <coughs> records are preserved and made accessible to the public? Mr. Come. Oh, I apologize, and Mark, you're the lead off on that. Thank you. Uh, I hope you all can take, take a, an opportunity to go on my website and look under a tab on policies and, and, and public <laughs> papers. Uh, I know it's wonky, and, uh, <laughs> but some of you are wonks. A lot of you are, and I love you all for it. But this one is on it, and public records is important to me. I would house the public records advocate in the Secretary of State's office, but instead of that position being appointed by the governor or any elected official, it would be appointed by a newly constituted uh, council, similar to the way the Ethics Commission is set up today. That would let her or him work without any kind of fear of political influence. Digital records are how we keep records today. And there is a manageable way to make them accessible to the public. The state of Washington has done that. I've talked to them, and I have a plan similar to what they are doing without charging prohibitive fees. It's manageable, and it's a way to help Oregonians. This is important to me, as I mentioned, because of my background in journalism, but it also seems like a fair and open way to run government. When we held hearings and meetings on the Student Success Committee this year, I made sure everything was out in the open, on the record, warts and all, mistakes and all, and you can go back through that. I'm very proud that I was all done in the open. The record is wide open. When Oregonians have access to their government, their government works better. Thank you. Jennifer. So how information is being created, shared, and retained is, as we know, different now. And we have to update, modernize all of our laws around public records. But I think as a watchdog, there has to be a balance. And we need to err on the side of shining a light on and making much more information available to the public as much as possible at a time when information from the free press is under attack. 
And as journalists are losing their very lives, we must be vigilant about what information is available to the public. As a young lawyer, I started my legal career in the courtroom fighting for the rights of journalists and public watchdogs, everybody from Willamette Week to the New York Times to Human Rights Watch. And so I'm ready to take on this fight about getting information to the public. And we have a crisis of confidence in our government right now at all levels of the public. One key thing we need to do is rebuild trust in our transparency and our accountability, and that's in every branch of government. And what we're seeing every day right now is what's playing out in the national scene with the president. What's happening is that we don't have that kind of openness and transparency, and we are seeing politicians getting away with covering things up, and it's impacting our public conversation and our public trust, and that is not okay. Um, public records are not a small and wonky thing. They are an incredibly important thing. And the reality is they show us how, things, how decisions are made, who benefits, and at whose cost. And Oregonians deserve to know. Thank you. Jamie. Thanks. Uh, my commitment to this uh, dates back to, I think it was 2006, when I was a city councilor and really pushed for open records uh, within the city I was serving in. Open, accessible, transparent government is critical to building and rebuilding public trust. Um, so yes, Oregon law says every person has right to inspect non-exempt public records of a public body. And there are challenges that we need to recognize, staffing challenges. If you, are, you receive a larger request, um, there's costs involved, there are retention schedules, but I think we should be looking at those. Um, and, and protecting people's privacy as well. There is, there is a bit of a balance on this. But we need an investment to make sure that our digital records are accessible um, and searchable, and there have been some challenges with that over time. Um, government needs to provide checks and balances, and um, I agree with Mark. I, I support an independent public records advocate um, it, because the, that role of free press and that, that checks and balances on our system is critically important. Uh, this is an area where it should be a no-brainer across party lines, um, but we still need to take action, and sometimes there are resources that need to be brought to bear to help to make it happen because IT is a lot of work. It's a big investment. So that's also a decision that needs to be made and a commitment that needs to... Um, um, that drive and that commitment needs to be shown and come out of the legislature. Thank you. Ryan. I want to pr uh, protect public records as a valuable resource of reliable ob objective facts. When it comes to archives, we need to adopt a streamlined system. Effective titling and optimization of search results uh, will need to be implemented. Rather than rely on uh, third party solutions to make this possible, I want to tap into our education system for recruiting. Oregon has one of the most high profile education systems in America. If we coordinate with Oregon based colleges and universities, we can recruit developers and create accessible structures to convert written documents into digital documents as well as create user friendly search engine uh, to optimize data retrieval. Uh, the communication channels between the departments need, needs to be repaired, and the records division is where I would uh, initiate those types of changes. Thank you. Those, that closes it out for the questions, and we now go right to our closing statements, and we will begin with Jennifer. All right, I get to open and close. So we're in the fight to save our very democracy, and the good news is we're all in this fight together, and that's the way Oregon works best. So I'm glad we're all here in this room having this conversation this morning. And that's why I'm running for Secretary of State. I know how to get into a fight and how to win a fight. And that's why I'm here. This election is about our democracy, about protecting our democracy. It's about clean and fair elections that are free from tampering. It's about our right to vote. And it's about lifting up communities and their rights to vote. It's about more people having a voice and that every vote is counted and every voice is heard. Oregon works best when we all have a say and we are all in, in the fight together to save our democracy and our state. We're under attack and people, it, it's impacting people's willingness to engage, to vote, to be in their communities. And that's what they want, right? They, they want people to stay home and we can't let that happen in our communities. And people will say that kind of erosion can't happen here. It's already happened here. We saw it when the Republican senators walked out. That's a, an erosion of our democracy and a, an erosion of Oregonians' voters' voices. And they're threatening to do it again. They're gonna do it over our children's future, over gun violence and climate. 
They're gonna shut down government over our children's future. So if you don't think they can do it at the ballot box, they can, they've already done it here. That's why I'm in this fight. That's why I believe we need to protect our democracy together. This election is so important. It's not gonna be an easy fight, but no fight worth fighting ever is. Thank you, Jamie. Well, thank you all for being here and for this opportunity to start this conversation. I'm running for Secretary of State to protect our democracy, to build stronger communities, and to safeguard our environment. We protect our democracy through election security and integrity, make, build stronger communities through ensuring our public resources are well managed, and then also helping to grow small business. And we safeguard our environment by creating and implementing a sustainable vision for our state lands and waterways. Our core values of fairness, of equity, of inclusion should apply to everyone. People right now feel alienated, unseen and unheard in urban and rural areas. There are un there's unseen diversity throughout our state. I serve on the, uh, the rural Jefferson County ESD and in Madras High School, this, the population of school is a third, a third, a third, a third tribal kids, a third Latinx kids, and a third Caucasian kids. A lot of folks don't realize that kind of diversity is in our rural communities. We have youth, seniors, disabled people, poor people, people of color, tribal communities, um, communities of faith like the Muslim community, LGBTQ folks, working families, and others, veterans who feel unheard. And we must change that. Frankly, we can talk about progressive ideas amongst Democrats and in urban areas. That's easy. We need to be going beyond our comfort level into, air, into rural communities and other communities to talk about, talk in ways that people can hear us and find shared values. I can tell you from the past two years, they're there to find. And the things we've talked about tonight, we have shared values statewide around these issues. But we need to go out there, work, and build, bring those communities in. And I mentioned my opening, and I hope I mentioned county rather than district, but as an example, here in Deschutes County, uh, I won it last year as part of my race, the last time it had, had been won by a Democrat running for Congress, uh, 1974 and before that, 1929. We can build these coalitions. I'm proud of my reputation, showing up for showing up, listening, building bridges, and finding solutions. We need to build an Oregon Way 2.0 that is inclusive and equitable because even though we're proud of this Oregon Way, it left out many people in the past. We need to build towards a future where people are included. Government needs to role model working together because other Oregonians are doing it. We need to uh, have, uh, have Oregonians be inspired by government, not intimidated by it. Democrats will have a tough choice in this race, but there is a standard for our nominee. Do we have a track record to show that we've worked on solutions that are specific to this job? Do we keep our promises, hold true to our values even under pressure? And can we serve all Oregonians? That is the standard, not just for the primary, but that will decide whether or not a Democrat is sworn in as Secretary of State in 2020. I welcome that standard. And again, if we can't achieve it, I'm not convinced we can win in, in 2020. I, with gratitude that I'm uh, running for this position, I would appreciate your support. And to just join Mark's plug, Jamie for Oregon is my website. Thank you all for being here. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Ryan. In 2016, we saw the polarization of this nation. There was uh, voter suppression and efforts to make sure that uh, one side would win at all costs. And that uh, ha has spread throughout states. And Oregon does not want to become the next state to fall in that path of dominoes. And I'm running because I want to promote civic engagement, audit public accounts, and protect public records. And today you have a choice of four wonderful candidates. I, uh, these, <laughs> me too. <laughs> uh, and uh, and I, I, I have a vision for Oregon to see us become more secure in our registration process and uh, to, to encourage all citizens to get out and vote. And I, and I believe that that is the most important thing that we can do is to promote people to get out and vote. That's the best way to vote, uh, defend against uh, voter suppression. And uh, that's why I'm running. Thank you, Ryan. Mark. 
I guess what I would ask all of you here today is, is to look at ideas that all of us come up, because that's what we want, isn't it? Policy ideas. That's what we like in the, in the in debates with the presidential candidates, the Democrats. I like hearing, you know, the, the arguments of Medicare for all versus Obamacare and how are we going to do this? How, how will we pay for higher education tuition versus community college? How are we going to do that? I like that. And I think you do too. And I hope this race is decided on those policy ideas. And that's a mainstay of why I'm running. We want this decided by someone who has the best ideas, not the best slogans, the best ideas. I have the experience to run this office. I've been in a Capitol building for a while. I've won some big battles in that building, and I've lost some big battles in that building. And you need the experience to stay there and have undergo those those pressures, especially on redistricting. And I know what that feels like. And I know what it's like to hold on to the rails of that ship when the storm comes by and starts to blow you off and you have to hang on. I know what the constitutional responsibilities are relevant to this office. I know about protecting our elections and I have plans for that and for redistricting and for audits. And so I know these tough battles, I fought them, I've proven myself. We passed full day kindergarten. We passed the Oregon Promise, which provides free community college tuition, and this year we passed the Student Success Act. Those aren't talking points. We call those state laws now, and I know how to get those things done. And I have the experience to do that, and I'm taking that experience to this office, and I respectfully ask for your help, encouragement, and support. Thank you, Mark. Let's give every one of these candidates a big round of applause.